Hello everyone, today we talk about the Principality of Serbia and the Vlastimirovic dynasty. We are essentially talking about the early medieval Serbian state between, as we will see now, we, we conventionally start from 780 because the first r ruler of the Vlastimirovic dynasty is known by name, right, and we end there is no happy end to this actually as we will see i will not spoil you the end if you're actually um if you're not aware of what happened but this is part of our series of of course the historical region we already for, for serbia we traced the sort of prodrome concerning the origins of the serbs as a people the um beginning let's say of the Serbian settlement in what would become loosely at least the center of what mm, today's Serbia would evolve from politically in the Balkans but uh, as we have seen uh, there, there is a, an intense debate not just regarding the the actual origins of the white Serbs etc and again we, we discussed this it's not a particularly problematic topic either right but it's all something that we have to put together without too much explicit information and also the possibility of the existing of a great Moravia not really morally more or less around today's Slovakia but actually right what um, some sources refer to as in fact around this this area eventually in the middle Danube we already discussed the evangelization of the Serbs we were already acquainted with the De Administrando Imperio that today we will come back using profusely this um, essentially encyclopedistic work written actually in Greek right um, to my son my own son Romanus right by um, the Byzantine Emperor Constantine the seventh right and describing in fact this early uh, Serbian communities about which in fact we wouldn't know uh, a lot right up to the same to, you know we, we've made a video about Constantine the seventh we are in the first half of the 10th century but of course the information uh, provided by the source dates back and you know chronologically in a consistent way helping us regarding this so I'm, I'm going to skip that and as always in the uh, top fix comment I provide with a list of, of the previous videos in which I discussed this and you can search medieval Serbia Sparepunkt on YouTube and it's gonna be fine so today we talk instead about not just the Principality of Serbia, but um, cursorily about the other Serbian principalities, such as the Oklea, Trevunia, Zaklumia, the Narentines, that is Pagania, Bosnia, and in general the um, let's say the also the the difficulties that we have in determining, for example, the actual boundaries. Um, also the interaction between the Byzantines, the, the Bulgarians, uh, and not only, right? So, we already observed from the settlement of the Serbs how fairly small and basic the political territorial units that the Serbs formed um, were, uh, and how, how isolated very often, um, like it mostly in the most fertile valleys in an otherwise mountainous, um, terrain. Uh, there is this connection with the Adriatic to the Dinaric Alps, we will see now. Um, and I recently made something about Croatia um, that completes what we started, in fact, about the same country in the early uh, medieval period that can help a bit and say, orienting yourself. Um, and so you look at these various um, river valleys, basins uh, with villages established. Um, and protected by the surrounding hills, right? You have this basic uh, Slavic um, political social organization that is the Zupa, that is essentially uh, a village and, uh, or a sum of villages eventually being lorded over by a single chieftain, that is the Zupan, in fact. And uh, that were, were in turn subordinated to a nobility, we will see later better, the, the Knets, right? And uh, 
the sources speak of a overall, um, if not unitary, however still hegemonic rule that would give rise, in fact, to the prince, what we call the principality, in that in the in the Greek sources you find as archon, right, uh, in Latin as dux, and that refers, in fact, to this greater political compaction, mostly from the uh, in fact, the, the eastern uh, watershed of the Dinaric Alps, aside from the other polities were fundamentally on the Adriatic instead. And, and as far again as the boundaries in the mountains, they're pretty difficult to to understand. Right? Um, so, there are naturally some ambiguities when we talk about the nets uh, in connection to the Ark, and this is not so important. The point, though, is that uh, the Serbian political organization started, of course, in a very local, autonomous way, where right? these were different communities that at some point began to coalesce, right? We already observed how, essentially, the, the Serbian settlement into its territories was carried out by some sort of military elite that began to lord uh, over other Slavs, even though the, the Serbs likely originally were not necessarily even Slavs themselves, probably uh, Iranians that, however, back in, in I mean, back from a, a Balkan perspective in, in Central Europe, where they had migrated from, from, from Eastern Europe, in turn had already been Slavicized, uh, importantly, right? So, initially, the principality um, as a state, let's say, cannot quite easily be uh, drawn on a map or even just conceived in the in the way, especially these guys would have really believed of themselves um, coalescing as a polity. In any case, that's where the the administrative imperial comes into play, right? Uh, this um, uh, historiographical term of Raška, right, that is also a geographical and historical region of Serbia, um, was conceived by the Byzantines as the baptized Serbia, in fact. So the uh, evangelized population that, that already bore this political identity on its own. And there is a list of settlements, some of which are unknown, um, that the, the administrative imperial gives. Um, so we have Destinicon, or um, Destinic, Dostinica, right, one of these eight cities. Um, uh, then Cerna Buske, Megi Retus, Dresnik, Lesnik, Salinas, that is um, today actually the third largest city of Bosnia and Herzegovina um, in the Tuzla canton of the Bosnian Federation. Then you have this um, small land, Corian in Greek, uh, of Bosnia that is conceived as such. I will make a video about Bosnia as well uh, to avoid, let's say, the misunderstanding, of course, boundaries were largely different um, from the ones we see today and just also the, the political and cultural identities varied importantly on the territory. Um, this boss in fact was considered as part of Serbia and it had the cities of Katera and Desne. We already discussed the evangelization of the Serbs, we were already acquainted with the De Administrando Imperio that today we will come back using profusely this um, essentially encyclopedistic work written actually in Greek, right? Um, to my son, my own son Romanus, right? By um, em the Byzantine Emperor Constantine the Seventh, right? And describing, in fact, this early uh, Serbian communities about which, in fact, we wouldn't know uh, a lot, right? Up to the time that you know, we we made a video about Constantine the Seventh. We are in the first half of the 10th century, but of course the information uh, provided by the source dates back, and, you know, chronologically in a consistent way, helping us regarding this. So I'm, I'm going to skip that, and as always in the uh, top fix comment, I'll provide with a list of, of the previous videos in which I discussed this, and you can search Medieval Serbia, Sparepunk on YouTube, and it's gonna be fine. So today we talk instead about not just the Principality of Serbia, but um, cursorily 
about the other Serbian principalities, such as the Oklea, Travunia, Zaklumia, the Narentines, that is Pagania, Bosnia, and in general the, um, let's say, the, also the, the difficulties that we have in determining, for example, the actual boundaries, um, also the interaction between the Byzantines, the, the Bulgarians, uh, and not only. Right. So, we already observed from the settlement of the Serbs how fairly small and basic the political territorial units that the Serbs formed um, were, uh, and how, how isolated very often, um, like mostly in the most fertile valleys in an otherwise mountainous um, terrain. Uh, there is this connection with the Adriatic to the Dinaric Alps, we will see now. Um, and I recently made something about Croatia um, that completes what we started, in fact, about the same country in the early uh, medieval period that can help a bit in, say, orienting yourself. Um, and so you look at these various um, river valleys, basins uh, with villages established um, and protected by the surrounding hills, right? You have this basic uh, Slavic um, political social organization that is the Zupa, that is essentially uh, a village and, uh, or a sum of villages eventually being lorded over by a single chieftain, that is the Zupan, in fact, and that were, were in turn subordinated to a nobility. We will see later better the the knets, right? And uh, the sources speak of a overall, um, if not unitary, however still hegemonic rule that would give rise, in fact, to the prince, what we call the principality. In that, in the in the Greek sources, you find as archon, right? Uh, in Latin, as dux. In that refers, in fact, to this greater political compaction, mostly from the, uh, in fact, the, the eastern uh, watershed of the Dinaric Alps, aside from the other polities were fundamentally on the Adriatic instead. And, and as far again as the boundaries in the mountains, they're pretty difficult to, to understand, right? Um, so there are naturally some ambiguities when we talk about the nets uh, in connection to the arc, and this is not so important. The point, though, is that uh, the Serbian political organization started, of course, in a very local, autonomous way, where these were different communities that at some point began to coalesce, right? We already observed how, essentially, the, the Serbian settlement into the territories was carried out by some sort of military elite that began to lord uh, over other Slavs, even though the, the Serbs likely originally were not necessarily even Slavs themselves, probably uh, Iranians. That, however, back in, in I mean, back from a, a Balkan perspective in, in Central Europe, where they had migrated from 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 Eastern Europe, in turn had already been Slavicized, uh, importantly, right? So, initially, the principality um, as a state. Let's say cannot quite easily be uh, drawn on a map or even just conceived in the in the way, especially these guys would have really believed of themselves um, coalescing as a polity. In any case, that's where the, the administrand imperio comes into play, right? Uh, this um, uh, historiographical term of Raška, right, that is also a geographical and historical region of Serbia, um, was conceived by the Byzantines as the baptized Serbian in fact, so the uh, evangelized population that already bore this political identity on its own. And there is a list of settlements, some of which are unknown, um, that the, the administrative imperial gives. Um, so we have Destinicon, or um, Destinic, Dostinica, right, one of these eight cities, um, uh, then Cerna Buske, Megi Retus, Dresnik, Lesnik, Salinas, that is um, today 
actually the third largest city of Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, in the Tuzla Canton of the Bosnian Federation. Then you have this um, small land, Corian, in Greek uh, of Bosnia, that is conceived as such. I will make a video about Bosnia as well, uh, to avoid, let's say, the misunderstanding. Of course, boundaries were largely different um, from the ones we see today, and just also the, the political and cultural identities very importantly on the territory. Um, this Bosnia, in fact, was considered as part of Serbia, and it had the cities of Katera and Desnik. By the way, these are just also the, the Greek names. And aside from Salines, are still today not identified. And the simple reason is that they were small towns uh, just for surviving, just with a, with a demographic continuity in the in interest of time, some may correspond actually to today's settlements. It wouldn't be actually anything strange about that, but maybe the center was not exactly where the the, the modern one stands, uh, and or other just in fact went uh, in ruin. If you essentially know also what happened to the the principality in the tenth century, well, that is also somewhat clear. So this area was wiped almost completely out, right? Very few people remained, um, and things had to be rebuilt uh, later. Not completely from scratch, but there is all uh, this early medieval phase that is pretty, it's pretty foggy, right? These centers are not even mentioned later, uh, so we know that in, in part they were short-lived, we only know that Destinicon was apparently the most important center, uh, also because of the local ecclesiastical uh, administration, so it was some sort of capital, even though for, for the time being actually it's quite an anachronistic term. Um, there is also no clear historiographical consensus regarding the status of the Stary Ras fortress, that, as you know, is one of the most important uh, centers in, um, in, in of medieval Serbia, and we will talk about it in some other video. That at this time, however, was seemingly uh, in the hands of the Bulgarians. Right? At least we know that uh, in the mid ninth century was renovated, inhabited, and controlled by the Bulgarians, and that it was located on the Serbian. Uh, Bulgarian frontier, so it would pass uh, to different hands, but uh, it seems that, in fact, the, as long as the, uh, the, the Bulgarians had the upper hand, um, and they were by far the biggest power at this point, in spite of the difficulties in curbing this early medieval Serbia, they controlled this quite um, sort of iconic center in Serbian history. As far as the sources go, it seems that the first uh, that was a continuity, let's put it in this way, between the early archon, the, the term of ruler and sort of, you know, superior leader, this is what the concept basically means, right? It's it's not a Basileus, it's not you know, it's it's not like the Archaeus Eleuchia yeah, in, in, in ancient times, it was sort of a, of emperor even, right? Not in the scale that, of course, an empire is conventionally called, but someone who effectively had a lordship, right? Let's put it in this way, over other communities, even. Um, and this is the term that was used, in fact, in Greek, to describe the first leader that had brought the Serbs to the Balkans in what would have been Heraclius' times. I widely discussed this thing, so there is no need to digress further on it. The point of why we do not count... Uh, this uh, as the 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 first leader of the anonymous leader of the Serbian principalities that historiographically the convention is we we, st we start just from the first guy whose name is is known right explicitly um, there is also a general understanding that by Constantine the seventh times so Heraclius as you know is in, in in the seventh century basically all the other rulers that had followed. Um, he initially had been lost uh, in memory, 
So we do not know their names, who they were practically. Right? There is this literal anonymous archon that is mentioned as the first Serbian ruler. We know, however, that there was a sort of dynastic continuity, which is interesting because um, here we know it through, through the Byzantines that consider this territory is also part of, of their empire, right? And the guy who was called by the Byzantines, in fact, to settle within the, the imperial boundaries, that is the anonymous, would um, be succeeded by his descendants, right? So the archons that followed would belong to his family line. And after a certain amount of time, we know of, in fact, the first known ruler, Vyacheslav or Vojislav, right? So the first Serbian ruler known by name. We will look at the chronology, essentially around the 80s of the 8th century, a contemporary of Charlemagne, basically. He was the father, and we know here we start knowing the, the actual names of his descendants as well. Radoslav who was the father of Prozigoy, and the, uh, that in turn was the father of Blastimir, from which the, uh, the name of the Blastimirovich dynasty takes uh, the name. Um, so we can make some basic and approximate calculation of when more or less these rulers in fact had come around, right? Because if we talk Heraclius times, we are in the early 7th century. Um, we know that the Bulgars invaded um, the region in 680, right? So, given that we start having some parallels in, in history, we can estimate that around the 80s of, of the 8th century, Vyacheslav came into power, right? Because we know that one of his two successors was in power in 822. The Royal Frankish Annals that scope this far away southeastern frontier, right, with some, however precious, a detail, um, associate him with the ruler Ludovic of the Pannonian Slavs. I made a video about those. Essentially, the Carolingians attacked. Uh, the Pannonian, say, main center of Sishak, and um, Ludovic was entrenched there, fled over to the Serbs, right? And the, the source, interestingly enough, in, um, in Latin says, Sisha civitate relicta ad sorabos que natio magnam dalmatia partem obtinere dicitur fugendo se copli. Right, so basically the guy... Um, went over to, to the Serbs that, according to the source, were sent to be holding um, the large part of what had been Roman Dalmatia. Now, the author of the Frankish Annals is actually not very knowledgeable about the region, right? Dalmatia was this sort of heavy Latin name recurring in, in ancient history, and so more or less everybody knew what Dalmatia was, but what in those years, in the 20s, the 30s of, of the 9th century, this would sort of be in a political sense, especially from this Frankish source, is, is pretty vague. So we do not know exactly where Ludovic was settled. There's another important source, the Vita Ludovici, that is um, the biography of Louis the, the Pius, that uh, does not mention, actually, the Serbs. And um, we know that Ludovic was quite, uh, quite a you know, busy ruler. He killed, the, wherever he was settled, the local Slavic Shupan. Um, so he took over the local approximating same county that he had taken refuge in. Today we think that this place was located somewhere in Bosnia. Um, and some historians connected specifically to the village of Serb that is located in the southeastern part of Lika, 
Croatia today. Um, there is just one connection actually, for this being the case, uh, given that we have a 14th century source saying, saying that this village had been the seat of a court like in the old times, but it doesn't seem actually a very reliable historical connection, right? Too vague, just per se. The Frankish Chronicle speaks of the Croatian settlements as castles, right? Castella in, in Latin. Um, while the settlements occupied by the Serbs as civitates, that is, cities. Now, this distinction is quite fascinating because it may be connected, here I'm just speculating, honestly, with the, the concept of uh, Great Moravia that we recalled before. So that's actually a big thing, because it may be that there was some sort of broader Serbian and or Slavic settlement uh, that we didn't consider um, in its fullest, and that we may have equivocated with the northern uh, Great Great Moravia that we sort of more linearly, conventionally um, identify. Because actually, before the Magyar settlement, uh, the, the two areas were pretty much in contact, right? After the destruction of the Avar Kaganate, uh, there was no barrier between the Western and the Southern Slavs. And so, so I, I explained this in the video about the Great Moravia. There may have been actually a, like two chunks connected by the Pannonian Corridor and the Southern part being actually more important. And it's sort of also more urbanized, which kind of makes sense if you consider that we're talking essentially the surroundings of Belgrade. And so, an area that had been urbanized from ancient times, of course, decayed somewhat, but surely more developed than what Slovakia technically um, was. Um, and uh, again, today's video is going to be complicated enough. I'm not going to digress on that, but I already dealt with that. If you're interested, you can check that out. Um, because of his exploit, let's put it in this way, Ludovic was finally obliged to flee uh, from the the, the Serbian um, area and taking refuge in Croatia, where he was, however, soon killed. The Pannonian uprising against the Franks, the Serbs supported the rebels, which basically place them from the Byzantine side that were sort of fueling this uh, from, from the other side. Again, I explained this in the video about the Duchy of Croatia that sort of explains the triangle uh, there. Um, we do not know, however, how much the Serbs directly interfered uh, um, in the northwestern uh, affairs, right? Uh, we can imagine, of course, some bands like participating in throughout these centuries as a whole, like the 8th, the ninth, again, there was a lot of open land out so, uh, and opportunities, especially before the, the Magyars settled in, and as you know, that historically would repress the Serbs um, from the Hungarian side. Um, and there is, in fact, a series of um, troubles that start in, in that uh, sense, even before the Hungars uh, came in as those who had profited the most in the Balkans of the collapse of the Avar Khaganate were the Bulgars, right? These guys had installed themselves, I made a video about the first Bulgarian Empire, uh, in the Balkans. They basically began to lord over the Slavs. They, the Bulgars were of Turkic origin mostly. They had Iranians among them, you know, we know because there were different um, sort of uh, languages. Um, inscribed on times and so, uh, of, of these aristocracies they were quite mixed and we will talk about pre-settlement history of these peoples soon at least as far as the military uh, is, is their military is concerned um, and the Bulgars were quite a pain in the behind um, for Constantinople as we've seen very often have multiple videos about medieval Bulgaria the 9th century was a bit the peak uh, of this um, Constantin, at least in you know the early you know aggressive and compromising phase, Constantinople was attacked, and the Bulgars gradually evolving into the Bulgarians conquered many 
different uh, Slavic communities that lived in the Balkans. Um, there are some mm, legions sometimes, we, we can't digress on these people's individual, but think about the Guduscani or Goduscani, right? That would have been conquered by the Bulgars, but it's uncertain. The Timozani, right? Um, it's another South Slavic tribe living in the territory of present day eastern Serbia, west of the Timok River. Um, the, 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 these ones took refuge in the, the, the Frankish orbit. These groups fled west. Uh, seeking refuge under Carolingian control. Then we have other populations like the Predenecenti uh, um, living in this broader frontier not, in a better specified way between the Bulgarians and the, and the Carolingians and the Mariani mentioned by the Bavarian uh, geographer that were literally wiped out at least as, a, as an independent as independent groups, right? We do not hear of them historically afterwards. There were also some others that had survived, obviously, in the Pannonian plain that were invested by the uh, the Bulgarians and, you know, obliged to, to move away as well. Now, the reason why this is connected with the Serbs is that when the Bulgarians extended their control in the Morava Valley in Belgrade, they met with them, and differently from these other Islamic populations, the Serbs took their stand against the Bulgarians. Right? Uh, this seemingly happened under the Prince Vlastimir, and according to the De Administrando Imperi, uh, the Serbians won against the uh, invasion of their lands against uh, carried out by Prezian Khan of Bulgaria uh, during the first apparently Bulgarian Serb war between 839-842. The Bulgarians had as an objective to subdue the Serbs as they had done with other Slavic peoples, but Vlastimir took his stand and he was defeated. He wouldn't it, there was an option at that point for for these Serbs to to move as well towards the west, but they were evidently a large and sort of entrenched enough people to um, to resist. Like they they would do that later historically because also their location in these uh, mountainous uh, interland was was quite prohibitive even for a, a direct control. At times the Serbs were subjugated by these eastern. Uh, rulers, but um, it's not that they disappeared or the, the latter had uh, any capacity to essentially re ethnically mold um, that land. Right. Also, consider that there wasn't really any space likely where these guys could go. I mean, the, the Franks had been hegemonizing all the, the northern, um, western side, right? They, they infiltrated to undetermined degree along the, the Adriatic as well. Um, Zaklumia that we will observe later um, being under some sort of Serbian control was also essentially a, a Carolingian client state uh, and so the, the word the Dinaric Alps in between so th there wasn't really much that could be done right um, and uh, the Bulgarians tried to keep pressing the Serbians, but fundamentally Khan Pre Prezian lost the majority of his army, and after these three uh, years long campaign was obliged to, to abandon the land. By the way, um, uh, the, the the Serbian Archon, Vlastimir, uh, sought support among the Travunians. He married his daughter among this um, this clan that ruled, as we will see now, some uh, an area on, on the Adriatic. Vlastimir died around the mid 9th century. Count Prezian in 852. In spite the dynastic succession that had followed, in a, at least in a biological sense, but not in a formally institutionalized one, we see, in fact, 
that um, the Serbian throne, right, was inherited actually jo and jointly by the three sons of of Blastimir, that is Multimir, Stroimir, and Goinic. Now, the, the first one was as the elder um, son had, let's say, the highest ruling right. There may have some been some Byzantine um, intervention into this because it's it's likely that the uh, at this point in history the well, this is debatable at least, but th there evidently still was room for, if not an equal um, partition of the inheritance among the uh, the sons, uh, still some again continuity in the in the rule by by the by the brothers, right? And uh, as such as we'll see now, they would also claim the inheritance to their. Um, elder brother's uh, branch later on. So this was actually common among the Slavs and other tribal peoples just at this point were sort of growing to something more dynastically oriented. Bulgaria was ruled by Boris the first. We talked about him uh, mostly for our uh, evangelization of Europe series. He was Prasian's son, and he felt quite um, wrong about what uh, the Serbians had done in resisting, essentially, to the Bulgarian uh, uh, onslaught. And so he attacked Serbia once again. This occurred in 853, and yet again, the Serbians managed to uh, re repulse the enemies. This, however, spiraled as a situation in likely decades of warfare, meaning that there wasn't to be any particular peace between such a major power like Bulgaria was expanding anyway, right, and this smaller Slavic power. So much so that different historians actually tell us about mm, multiple instances of warfare uh, in 854, 58, 63, 64, 70, also in the 80s of the 9th century. So it's clear that, of course, there was a continuous, uh, at least raiding warfare along the frontier. The Serbians and the Bulgarians didn't like uh, each other very much. They were essentially incarnating two different principles of power. For, of course, they especially they were both influenced by the Byzantine models. The Bulgarians were the, the more powerful uh, ones of, of the two. Um, so the Serbians would mm, also grow right, politically and um, institutionally getting like something out of, of these neighbors. Right, fas est et ab oste docker, as the Latins uh, said. Right, this game, by the way, was part of a much bigger one, as the Byzantines were trying to weaken the Bulgarian-Frankish alliance. Um, that was also tormenting Great Moravia as well, and as we've seen, the Serbians may have been connected with that. The Bulgarians were also fostering relations with the Roman papacy. Um, the relations between the the Franks and the Bulgarians were not that nice. Look, nobody really liked each other here. But um, the alignment had mostly remained uh, like that. The Carolingians were actually fading towards, in fact, the, the 80s of, of the 9th century. And the, the reality of the Balkans is that, of course, the Serbians had pretty much to rely on themselves. Multimir and his brothers um, managed to repel again the, the Bulgarian invasion of 853. They even managed to capture Boris's son and heir that had been put by his father at the head of the expedition. We're talking of uh, Vladimir of uh, Vladimir Razek, right? Uh, 
Vla uh, Vladimir of Bulgaria that ruled, in fact, later in eight, from 889-893. Also, 12 boyars, right, so the highest rank of the Bulgarian nobility were captured during, during this battle. And such situation brought Boris to agree bitterly to a peace treaty with the Serbians. And there is this instance in which uh, the two sides have to make peace formally, right? Uh, Boris uh, has his son uh, still a prisoner of the Serbians. So they arrange um, the, the prisoner's release uh, with, uh, at the border, right, once the, the peace was, was agreed. Um, Mutimir, not to say this figure um, uh, as, as fearful, sent two younger sons of his, that, that is Bran and Stefan, the eldest one, Pribislav, that was heir to the throne, was, however, and cleverly kept at home, because... Uh, course, uh, a meeting between the Serbians and the Bulgarians in, in the 9th century had quite high chances of escalating into, you know, bloodshed. Um, uh, but uh, the, there, there was actually a, an agreement. Uh, Boris gave the Serbians some uh, expensive gifts. The Serbian princes gave him two slaves, two falcons, two dogs, and 80 fours, apparently. Uh, which was also a recognition of, you know, of course, of, uh, of valor, of some way, of recognizing that power and, you know, arranging this, this settlement. In fact, peace was reached um, with, with Bulgaria. The same cannot be said internally to Serbia, though. In fact, Mutimir, who was the eldest and probably the most powerful uh, person in the, uh, in the Serbian principality, expelled his brother Stroimir. Mutimir kept, however, in Serbia Peter Gojnikovic, that was the son of Gojnik, thus his nephew. We do not know exactly the year when this happened, but it's between 863-873, um, because, you know, that's where evangelization started. Essentially, Mutimir is the first, um, you know, recognized Christian ruler uh, in Serbia that up to, to this point had remained roughly pagan. Of course, there were Christians as well, but um, this, you see, compaction of power of a single ruler is something that basically stems also f from the increasing hierarchy in, in ecclesiastical uh, foundations, uh, the development of administration. 873 is the year in which Pope John VIII, that was quite involved in Balkan affairs, sent a letter to Mutimir uh, only, because otherwise uh, he would have addressed like the other two brothers, and so we know that that's when the latter uh, two had been expelled, right? Petar Gojnikovic managed, however, to escape to Croatia. You can imagine here all the, you know, the Bulgarians, the, the Croatians, the, are exploiting this uh, Serbian uh, turmoil, right? Um, Stroimir remained an exile in Bulgaria for the rest of his existence. Uh, Boris, Ken Boris, in fact, married Stroimir to a Bulgarian noble woman. They had a son, Tsaslav, that, uh, in fact, Klonimirovich, that is uh, going to be a pr prince of the Serbs, as we will see later. Mutimir was succeeded by his eldest son, Pribislav. Uh, this happened after his father's death. I mean, there the would have been possibly the practice of associating uh, heirs to the throne in some, in some guise. But this happened uh, in 891, in fact. At this point, the descendants of the Mutimir's brothers from the exile... Uh, ex exploit the succession to come back to Serbia and to reclaim their throne and, and order part of their power. In 892 you have Petar uh, Gojnikovic returning from Croatia. 
and succeeding in the expulsion of all three Mutimer sons to Croatia in turn, so we're talking the aforementioned Pribislav, Bran and Stefan, he would rule Serbia until 917, uh, during uh, which period uh, he had to fight uh, against rebellions, attempts, um, two major ones uh, for his dethronement. And pretty bloody affairs followed, like Petar defeated the blinded Bran, for example, as the latter had tried to overthrow him in 895 with Croatian forces that had attacked um, uh, the Serbians. In 897, uh, the same Petar crushed Kolonimir's Bulgarian-backed uh, invasion that succeeded in briefly capturing uh, even the city of Dostinica, like, again, the, the most important Serbian center at the time, right? But uh, Klonimir um, was uh, ultimately defeated and killed by Petar, right? So it, the, that's how you, you settle uh, this matter. In all this, the Serbian-Byzantine relations were were okay, all right? Uh, Leo VI... Leo the Wise, ruling between 886 and 912, made a video about him. He's also uh, the author of the Tactica, They're basically an expansion of, of um, you know, the, the pseudo Maurice's strategic, and that adds some details about the Slavs and their warfare. But fundamentally, it's always um, similar. Uh, the same relations with Bulgaria at the time of the, the Tsar Simeon the um, First, one of the most important rulers in the history of the country. Um, and there was the second son of the late Emperor Boris, uh, were actually positive, right? So there was a moment of final stability. This had evidently passed through the literal decapitation of the, the main opposing branches of the Vlastimirovich dynasty. The same Tsar Simeon had baptized Petr uh, through this uh, custom of the as it was known um, in the Balkans. These were not easy times uh, abroad because the same Byzantines and, and Bulgarians were fighting uh, in between 894 and 96, for example, 913 uh, 27. And the Serbians were essentially observing the, the situation, plus, considered the Magyars had already established themselves in the north. So, um, this was overall not just a particularly, uh, let's say, expansive time. Uh, also, if you consider the, the broader turmoil, that again, all these wars, also the the collapse of the Carolingian Empire, the second invasions, uh, etc. The Battle of Ancialus, the Serbians could not quite keep themselves out of it, right? They were a smaller power, they needed to bet either on one contendant or on the other. At the Battle of Ancalus, or Achalos, 917, uh, near the Bulgarian Black Sea coast, um, the Bulgarians scored an important victory over the Byzantines. Right? Simeon, on August the 20th, um, managed to defeat a larger force. Uh, we do not know the exact number of the losses. The, the Byzantines had apparently 30,000 men. Um, the Bulgarians, half of that. And the imperial forces, I mean, they were both imperial powers, second, but the Byzantines suffered heavy casualties. And Petar uh, was uh, apparently, at that point, leaning on the Byzantine side, which was sort of the most convenient thing to do for Serbia. I mean, Serbia would maintain, after all, positive relations with the Byzantines in um, in a broader sense, given that, again, the, the major trouble for the country arrived from the Pannonian or, or, or Bulgarian area, and the Byzantines had literally the, the Balkan mountains in between. I mean, the, the Serbians were not a, a threat, practically, and um, they actually were this wedge, like, to also quite sensibly strategical area, like one around Sirmium and, uh, and Belgrade. So that would be the tendency, like, if 
the, the, the Serbians could be all, uh, say could be in positive relations with with the Bulgarians, peaceful ones at least. But it's obvious that the the latter's power was always a threat uh, to Serbia, and it would have always tried to keep expanding, especially when the, Byzant the, the problems with the Byzantines were over. So it did make sense to to bet uh, on the latter, right? Uh, and right before the Battle of Ankialus, Petar is said to have met on the bank of the Neretva River, one of the largest rivers on the eastern part of the Adriatic Basin, with Leo Rab um, Rabdoukos, a Byzantine nobleman uh, and diplomat that was at the time the Strategos of Durakion, right, so the region of Epirus. And there were some negotiations. Uh, Michael Vishevitz, the semi-independent Saklumian ruler, who was allied with Tsar Simeon of Bulgaria, because uh, the Principality of Serbia was instead here the bigger power compared to this Adriatic ones, and uh, he allied, of course, with, with the Bulgarians. So the idea is that you, if you weaken the the, the principality will feel better, right? So, sort of, um, you know, accuses um, Petar in front of the Bulgarian emperor, accusing the, in fact, uh, Serbian archon to be colluded with the Byzantines during the the open war uh, between the Bulgarians uh, and Constantinople. And at this point, that the Bulgarians had scored this major victory over the Byzantines, of course, there, there would have been some new opportunity for the Bulgarians to expand westward uh, again, right? And uh, the and Michael also told um, Simeon that the Byzantines were actively bribing Petar so that he could join forces with the Magyars to attack Bulgaria. And the Magyars had, um, at this point, as you know, occupied uh, the, the, the Danubian and, and Tisha Valley, and they were sort of the major competitors in the, in the north, west uh, of, the, of the Bulgarians, right? So this all makes sense because at the end of the day, um, you know, a stronger Bulgaria was, was a problem for all these powers, right? And the Magyars were the opposite direction of the Byzantines. The, you know, the, he, here even at the latter had mediated some sort of, um, uh, a, say, agreement between the same Serbians and the Hungars that were surely not looking at each other in a very positive way. We'll see now what would happen, in fact. And um, Tsar Simeon used this pretext to declare, uh, to, to actually attack Serbia once again. Uh, in fact, a war was fought between 917-24, in which um, Pavle Branovic, that was the son of the blinded uh, Bran, right, uh, was um, put in command of, um, and uh, this was... Um, you know, uh, an important change of the situation because at the end of the day, Petar and Simeon had been previously in good uh, relations. Now, instead, Petar was captured uh, during this invasion and brought to Bulgaria where he died while in prison, so that the same Pavle managed to become Prince of the Serbs in ruling until 921. Naturally, this meant what? That Serbia had been uh, defeated, that Pavlov was a Bulgarian puppet, in other words. And this deeply upset the Byzantines, whose emperor, Romanus I, Lycapinus, organized a plot to overthrow Pavlov. This was carried out in a military operation handed by Pribislav's son. So you see, they, they fished them always from the, from, from the dynasty, of course, for greater legitimacy, because they wanted from Constantinople to control Serbia uh, in this way. 
Zaharia, who at the time, in fact, was a protege of the same Romanus in his Constantinopolitan court. He was, however, defeated. Pavle managed to uh, send him uh, to Bulgaria as a prisoner, because now it was personal also between the, the Bulgarians and the Byzantines, as far as this, you know, Bulga uh, Serbian affairs were, were concerned. In 923, Pavle, however, was, uh, you know, decisive enough to bail out of the Bulgarian uh, protection, given that uh, the Serbian aristocracy wanted to regain its own uh, independence. And what happened is curious, because now the Tsar Simeon sent the Saint Zakaria against him, right, as it had been initially um, attempted from Constantinople. And this time, the, the Bulgarians succeeded where the Byzantines had failed. Pavlo was expelled by Zaharia, who became the next Serbian prince. However, yet another plot twist, because, again, of, of the fact that you're ruling over Serbia anyway, Zaharia understood that this Bulgarian in interference was too, was too heavy, and he switched signed again to, to the Byzantines, right? This, this is very important, I would say, because it shows, we have seen it in the video about the first Bulgarian Empire, it doesn't matter how, uh, let's say, big and powerful the Bulgarians were, still their power was very floating in many ways. The aristocracies were sort of unruly. The Byzantines were a, a, sa a safer power. Um, the Serbians, as we've seen, were uh, just locked in, in that uh, geographical position, they, they couldn't quite do much else, but fearing, of course, Bulgarian expansion, and they didn't want to, they knew they could successfully oppose themselves to a Bulgarian conquest, right? You understand here that it doesn't matter how the Serbians were defeated at times, um, still the, the Bulgarians could not quite occupy directly their lands, right? In any case, um, they could do a lot of damage. In fact, Simeon sent an army to conquer the same Serbia, and at least to destroy it. Um, his troops were led by Theodor Sigritza, that was um, a Kavkan, right, uh, of, of, the, of the emperor, of the Tsar, and Marmes, that was yet uh, another nobleman, Komita, that is sort of count, or Duke, if you prefer, depending on how you compare the others in other systems. Um, Serbia was attacked in 924. The Bulgarians were defeated, right? Both commanders were killed. And the interesting part of this is that to signify the current political uh, alignment, Constantinople received their heads and weapons, right, sent by the Serbs, right? However, Simeon was not just a guy who backed down so easily. He mounted up a much larger expedition. Among the, um, the troops sent was Klonimir's son, Tsaslav Klonimirovich, that was evidently you know, used uh, to, to be installed as a, as a trustee in, in Serbia. There wasn't at this point much that the Serbians could do. If not, basically um, the, depriving Zaharia of support, the prince fled to Croatia. Uh, the much uh, more powerful Bulgarian forces were uh, unopposed in this. And they basically forced the Serbian Shupans to gather and so to formally accept Tsaslav as the new prince. The um, frustration of the Bulgarians is evident in the moment in which this assembly 
was used by them to capture all the Serbian troops and to deport them to Bulgaria. So the idea was decapitating the Serbian establishment that had orchestrated all these side switching and essentially depriving uh, the Serbians of, 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 of the head. We have in 925-26 a fierce revenge that the Bulgarians now almost unopposed inflicted on Serbia. The territory was devastated, right? Uh, an important part of the Serbians was enslaved and deported to Bulgaria. Some Serbians fled uh, either north to Croatia or uh, adventurously enough to through um, well via, via sea at some point but also through the same Bulgarian Empire by the various valleys reaching uh, the Aegean to the same Byzantine Empire. According to the, the Administrando Imperio, because of this reason, Serbia was literally depopulated, left deserted. Um, this exemplifies the magnitude of the destruction that Bulgaria delivered on Serbia. Right. Simeon died in 927. He was succeeded by Peter I, who um, changed his sensibly his father's policy by essentially accepting a, a Byzantine interference and heavier influence in, in Bulgarian affairs. Because of this, the Bulgarian harshness against the Serbs diminished, and Tsaslav, that had up to that point uh, been living in the Bulgarian de facto capital, Preslav, uh, took the chance to come back to Serbia and to restore some degree of uh, national rule. Right? We do not know exactly where this happened. Uh, we know um, seven years uh, after either the death of Simon or the uh, the expedition to Serbia three years before. In any case, by uh, the mid-30s uh, of the 10th century, uh, this had been accomplished. The, the Administrando Imperio is brutal regarding the, you know, the, the picture of Serbia after the Bulgarian devastations. It is said that the same emperor who traveled the same Constantine who traveled to Serbia had encountered um, with his entourage of four people only 50 single men, that is to say without wives, children, who just sustained themselves from hunting, true hunting, right? So basically a devastated scenario in which there is not even a sort of agricultural um, community that people live just out out there after this major destruction, devastation. Of course, this is not the real picture just per se, but there is no doubt that in this context, so you can imagine what Serbia was like by the 10th century in general, um, the Bulgarians were not exactly, you know, fighters provided with a particularly high sense of, of humanity. Uh, so you can imagine what would happen once the, the country had been left open to any kind of ravages, massacres, rapes, and whatever. Um, so even though, of course, there was some important continuity, surely there weren't just, you know, single men hunting in, in the woods, um, the degree of destruction uh, waged over, over this territory was massive, and the capacity of recovery was moderate, to say the least. Right. Uh, there is properly even an abandonment of... Um, here we're told by the source properly of the political administrative fabric, like even the fortifications were left abandoned, like there was probably nobody who thought that living there was so remunerative and that, you know, it's as if all hierarchy had collapsed, had been effectively undermined by the Bulgarian uh, offensive. This is part of the reason, likely, why Tsaslav recognized the supreme authority of the Byzantine Emperor Constantine the Seventh. They were actually friendly in terms like um, the emperor became 
Zaslav's mentor and protector, um, the, the 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 emperor also made substantial effort, um, to say the least, especially from a financial point of view, to help Serbia in this quite dire strait, um, so that there were some, for example, repopulation campaigns carried out. Um, this was done by inviting people from neighboring countries. And there was, because of such external influence, uh, a substantial recovery. Um, the relations with the Byzantines were especially good. Uh, now, the, the, the one with the Bulgarians, as we've seen, had been temporarily uh, normalized. He is positively considered something even of a possible expansion to Bosnia at this time. Uh, in any case, uh, this uh, situation hadn't quite solved um, Serbian problems in, in, in absolute terms. Ch uh, Chaslav uh, died sometime in, in the 40s of the 10th century. We have a new, albeit from a much later source of the late 13th century, that is also not particularly reliable per se, of a sort of major Serb war, uh, given that an anonymous priest from Duklia states that a Magyar nobleman called Kiza attacked a territory in Bosnia possessed by a certain Chaslav, who would be Chaslav, right? Um, uh, Chaslav, in fact, is, is, a, is a historical figure at this time. Uh, let's say this is not, you see, with this medieval sources, this is not confirmed by any other evidence, right? Except that something written 400 years later uh, and more uh, connects this, this names in uh, almost, um, you know, un undeniable way. The important, though, is that it is plausible, because the Magyars were also, uh, again, pretty adventurous in their lifestyle, to say the least, and they would, historically, uh, begin to harass the Serbians in that fashion. So the, there is actually nothing strange about something of this kind having occurred, right? A, a Magyar wanting to seize some territory in Bosnia in a moment of weakness on the Serbian frontier. Right, at this point, nothing really, really strange, especially considering that um, these are the same years of the Battle of the Lek, and so basically the end of the Magyar raids in the in the west, uh, and um, a temporary turn towards the Byzantine Empire that basically stopped immediately, but was essentially the last uh, attempt of the Magyars to keep living of out of you know spoils of war, raids of long-range um, loot. Um, and so it may actually fit the, the timeline, right? It's not something so strange after all, right? Chaslav died... Um, again, we do not even know particularly, even if it, if it is the 40s, right? And with him, also the Vlastimirovich dynasty did after some three centuries and a half, if we think that in fact the originary um, Serbian archon in Heraclius' time had belonged to the same dynasty, which, which is fascinating, right? And also likely, right? Uh, this is truly the the oldest Serbian ruling dynasty, and it's in fact remarkably uh, long lasting for the the say the circumstances of early high medieval times, especially in this part of Europe, right? There were other Serbian polities that, again, we, we can't digress too much in, in the depths of for each. Perhaps we will do it um, in another video. We really want to go look at things very much uh, in detail, but they're important to list because they were still partly subjected to the Serbian principality at this point. We're also partly Serbian, just um, from from the early migrations. Some we already 
talked about today. Um, Duclea on the Adriatic coast from the extending from the Bay of Kotor to the mouth of the Drin River. Exceptuated, however, the major coastal centers of Lecce, Ulcini and Bar, which were still controlled uh, via sea by the Byzantines. Right. Um, so the the areas over which um, Duclea, Duclea stretched was um, the one of the uh, Zeta and Morazza valleys. Um, similarly to Travunia and Zaclumia, on the northern side you have the mountains, which constituted a light in a non clear way the, the boundary with the Serbian principality of the Vlastimirovich, uh, that was known again as the at least by the Byzantines as baptized Serbia uh, in the in the, the Administrando Imperio. Right. Uh, the lands uh, going towards the Arachium were constituting basically the, the boundary of the territory with the, with the Byzantines. It was a very unstable um, uh, frontier, by the way. Like the Slavs were quite active, the, the Byzantines were trying, of course, to, to counter them. These were probably some of the northwesternmost parts of, of the empire because it was directly controlled by the empire. Then you had Travunia, that instead is located in the interland of Dubrovnik. I made a video about, um, about Ragusa. In fact, in the Middle Ages, uh, that speaks, in fact, of the relations with the interland. Um, the same so goes for for the Bay of Kotor, right? No, also known as the Boca, which uh, encompassed the fertile um, Serbian trupa of Konable, that is uh, also on on the sea southeast of Dubrovnik, today's Croatia. Travunia counted five towns: Trebinje, Verem, Rizon, Lukavete, and Zetlivi. This was a substantially autonomous power, like all these ones, actually, from the Vlastimirovich. Uh, but as we've seen, uh, Vlastimir married a daughter to the um, uh, son of Beloya, the Supan of Thermunia, named Krajina Belojevich, in fact, uh, thus this 9th century Slavic chifte, um, and Vlastimir would appoint Krajina as Knets, that is a similar title to the one of, uh, I mean, it, it sounds more like the one of a knight, right? But it's actually a nobiliar title of higher level. That, again, he did. The, the Serbian prince bestows uh, to his son in law, right? And Krajina's heirs are thus. Of Vlasivirovich blood from their ma mother's side, you have Valimir and Tsutsumir of the uh, Travunian dynasty and Belojevich clan using the same title of Nets, right, in a sort of dynastic sense, right. And the uh, the Administrando Imperio actually tells us that the Travunian archons were under the ones of Serbia. They phrase it like this. As you understand here, again, the what what is Serbian, what is not Serbian in a modern national sense is relatively dynamic. Uh, but here, of course, Serbia is intended in the source as the, the bigger principality, right? These guys were sort of akin, if not Serbians themselves, depending on, you know, whatever identity was connected politically and, and or militarily and culturally to to being a Serb, right, since Heraclius' time. This um, Travunia was also invested by uh, Fatimid raids from the Emirate of Sicily at the time of Basil I, the Macedonian, essentially after 867. Dubrovnik, as we were recalling in, in also in, in the relative video, was... Um, 
suffered of this onslaught and given the maritime connection that Travunia had with, with the Empire, Basil II sent some ships headed by the, um, the distinguished Byzantine official Patricius and especially Admiral Niketas Orifas, the Drungarius of the fleet, so the commander of the entire imperial fleet, who managed to force the Muslims into retreat, right? Uh, he essentially broke the blockade uh, of these Dalmatian cities and restored the Byzantine uh, connections with this uh, with these communities that, in fact, would not be infringed upon for several decades, right? What is interesting is that the Byzantine Empire used in these operations, of course, local Croatian and Serbian auxiliary forces, including naval ones, they weren't something so well organized like the, the Byzantines had or the, the Venetians were becoming, but they helped um, considerably and uh, logistically. For example, in the Byzantine-Frankish joint siege of the Emirate of Bari in Apulia on, on the Adriatic in 870-71, you know that there was a race in, in, in Apulia between the, the Carolingian kings of Italy and the Byzantine emperors to recover these um, coastal major coastal centers of Bari and Taranto that had been taken temporarily by the the Islamic pirates. Um, and, and, well, the Slavs were just on the other side of the Adriatic and they participated as well because, of course, they... They suffered of the, the Saracen interference, as we've seen. Some of them were part of the Byzantine orbit; others were suffering directly, and or were suffering directly from the Islamic um, offensive. So uh, they they participated. And historically, the, the Islamic pirates had been harassing the the Italian coasts. Like the, the Longobards had been quite frustrated by these. I mean, nothing threateningly serious in terms of local political stability, but still annoying and damaging, especially. Um, we know of, in fact, different forces, like um, the Ragusans would provide the ships, and some Slavic peoples would send simply their marines. Uh, Croats, Serbs, Zaumlians, Travunians, uh, Canaanites, the latter we will not talk about, but there were yet another Slavic uh, tribe settled uh, in today's region of Konavle within Dalmatia, um, Croatia. And uh, again, th they are mentioned by the De Administrando Imperio. We can't really talk about them all. And this gives you an idea of the level of fragmentation, by the way, that these peoples really had. Some of them had literally still tribal, um, you know, or a tribal organization. In fact, the principality of Serbia, as it also say that the policy would develop later, was always like the state. We can't say these other guys were sort of were different, and the fact that they were on the Adriatic sort of uh, ultimately made them escape even Serbian control to an important extent. When under Basil, the situation was repaired in the Adriatic. The Byzantine Emperor proceeded to sort of um, separate more rationally the areas of influence of the Croatians and the Serbians on the Adriatic. Um, this was a moment of reactivation of the empire, which also entailed the reinforcements also of the sort of Byzantine control on those, um, on those client states, de facto, because the Byzantines, aside from the coastal garrisons, did not really have a control of the Slavic interland, right? But... They, they of course could just exercise it by controlling the ports and therefore the interland economy. And the division went this way: essentially, uh, split Trogir, Zadar, Kres, Rab, and Kirk had to pay tribute to the Croatian state, while Ragusa slash Dubrovnik had to pay its tribute to the Serbian polities of Zaklumi and Travunia, 
which is interesting because it shows a separation existing within the Serbian space, broadly meant, between, in fact, the Principality and powers like Zaklumi and Travunia. And speaking of the former, this was occupying essentially the lower Neretva region. Um, it bordered on the west the Narentians, that we will see now, the Narentines of Pagania. In the north they bordered so-called baptized Serbia and, and Dubrovnik as well, so that was close as we've seen and also sort of more of a um, independent city than a territorial uh, entity right in the interland, so that's why these territories were to in the Byzantine mind to, to absorb it one or another. Also this polity had five towns, Ston, uh, Mokris, Kik, Yoslu, Galu, Mainik and Dubriskik, of which only the first location is known, specifically uh, at the south of Isthmus of the Peleshat um, Peninsula. In fact it's still a, a settlement in, in modern day Croatia, the others as we've seen for other also um, or continental Serbian uh, towns is not really are not really known, right? They sort of pass in some way, and or again are not identified in the places that we, in the settlements that still exist today, right? Um, we have seen how Simeon the first allied himself with Michael Bishevitz of Zaklumia in 925-26 to try to crush the Serbian Principality. Michael was present at the Council of Split that was uh, an important um, event in, in the local ecclesiastical history because uh, it was a church council held in the city. It was essentially trying to make the same ecclesiastical organization of uh, Croatia and Serbia to be differentiated, to be neatly separated. Right. In 926, Michael also carried out um, a seaborne attack on the Apulian town of Siponto, which was a way to please Constantinople. In fact, uh, the emperor uh, rewarded him with the titles of Antipatos, that is essentially the equivalent, the Greek equivalent of the Latin proconsul, and the one of Patricius of patrician right and you can easily see how these guys were uh, connected with the Byzantine Empire mostly via sea right because of their Adriatic position something more definitely different from the the continental Serbian standpoint which was opening set to an yet all another uh, mostly central European or Central, Southern European, dim continental dimension, anyway. Then there are the Narentines of Pagania. These are interesting, and we will have to make perhaps a video on, on their own. They occupied the area between the Neretva and the Tsetina rivers. It uh, consisted of only three Shupash, uh, Rastots and Mokra on the coast, and Dalen in, in the interland. And they were a sort of pagan pirate nest, right? As we've seen, the Serbians were just sort of converting overall. At this point, the Croatians had been a bit more exposed, especially to Rome, uh, to the Roman papal influence. Um, and the Narentines were instead much more sort of um, inward in, in this sense. They... Um, had a split um, economy which also influenced their activities as the first two supas were sort of maritime oriented and the uh, continental one, the, the latter, the continental one was instead more agricultural. They essentially would resist the efforts of to Christianization for a longer time. They held the strategic islands of Milet, Corsula, Brat, and Var that um, were abandoned at this point by the Romance population, uh, but uh, inhabited by the Narentine shepherds who had kept 
herds there, so they also had more a more primitive uh, life uh, lifestyle. Again, of all the Serbian tribes, they were not um, Christianized. That's why the Greeks called them pagans. Um, there was an instance recounted by the Venetian chronicler John the, the Diacon, the secretary to the Doge of Venice, um, that witnessed uh, around the 30s of the 9th century how a delegation of Narentines was baptized in the same Venice, uh, because in fact they, they were still pagan by that point. right? Um, there was also a, an attri a, an enmity with Venice that was ever more uh, aggressive on the Dalmatian coast. We've seen it also in the vi recent video about the Kingdom of Croatia. Um, so the the religious divide w was also a way of essentially separating these peoples within the, the international sphere. Now, of course, the Narentines were being just some sort of anarchic um, pirates, um, and not much more than that. In 835, um, in spite of the fact that having been baptized, this recalls a bit the Vikings, you know, that in some instances were baptized, were Christian, but also kept living their own way, and at least not considering that to be particularly binding, having pagan deities, of course, and rituals like being um, uh, still practiced. And uh, the, um, they, they attacked Venetian merchants and missionaries in the Adriatic which brought to the expedition of the Doge Pietro Tredonico in 839 uh, against the, you know, their, their nests, there was a, a peace reached with uh, the Duke Mislav of the Dalmatian Croatia. Uh, there was even um, uh, an alliance uh, sealed with Ruzak, a Narentine chieftain, but this this people were so unstable it just that there was no way to uh, to maintain this long lasting uh, I means any long lasting peaceful relation. In fact, the Venetians sent another fleet to restore uh, the situation, but they were defeated by the Narentines. In any case, Venice would end up crushing them for good. Now, what is interesting is that under the rule of Petar, uh, prince of, of Serbia, Pagania is mentioned by the, the Administrandum Imperio as subordinated to, uh, in fact, to, to Serbia. The source says that the Cetina River marked the extension of Pagania, right? But this was also, in fact, the broader border between Croatia and Serbia, right? Which technically made, uh, according to, at least logically to, this, to the source, the mm, the Narentines as a subject of the, of the time uh, ruler Chaslav. That the aforementioned meeting in 917 between Petar and the the Byzantine strategos of the Rakian to uh, to fight against the, uh, the the Bulgarians took place in the same Pagania that was in that occasion mentioned under Serbian rule, right? So this was a place that evidently had some sort of broader, perhaps just because there were Serbians recognized that the greatest rulers were the ones of the of the Principate and, and they were sort of in familiar connections the this could be seen as a hosting ground for such meetings for, uh, among a what was considered also an autonomous people so not to give too much of the sality um, to let's say the let's say too much responsibility connected to the place of this meeting which would, would is it's it's interesting because like a nest of pirates is just a place it's a sort of um, place out of the conventional um, you know territorial spheres of competence in any case we do not know much um, if not the fact that the Narentines were very uh, unstable just also f within the the same Serbian reality for example the boundaries with Croatia and Zaklumia uh, 
floated, right? Uh, the Narentines sided first with the Venetians, then with the Byzantines, right? And in practice, there was no direct Serbian princely control on Pagania, right? As far as Bosnia is concerned, we have a few evidence. We've seen that um, also from the, the administrative period, there, there is no much information regarding the state of Bosnia. It was understood as more peripheral to, to the Serbian rule. Uh, the Byzantine historian John Kinnamos, uh, living in the 12th century, tells by like the mid of the century, in fact, that the Drina River was the boundary between Bosnia and the rest of Serbia, right? So mm, he also adds that the Grand Shupan at the time, um, so the the main Serbian ruler, did not really control this territory, right? And Bosnia was probably not subject to it. Right, but it's uh, being a, a tribe which lived and and, and uh, was politically organized in a separate way. So it's interesting that this author states. Of course, this uh, tells us what in practice that if this was not under Serbian princely control by the mid 12th century, where there was a much more developed Serbian state, this had not practically been ever. Uh, under that princely control either in the previous centuries, right? Uh, and it's interesting that it's Bosnia is considered as part of Serbia but having a separated government, right? Um, also, there is a mention in the same source of the Bosnian Ban Boric, that is also, by the way, the first known by name, at least Ban of Bosnia, so considered this in relation also to Serbia, but as we've seen, had this basically almost 400 years before, um, as exarch of Bosnia. That is again a Serbian region, but here, other interesting addition by Kinemas was enrolled among the Hungarian rulers' allies. All right, so it was just exploiting its autonomy, its decentralized position to de facto remain uh, independent, which is which is fascinating. Again, we will see better Bosnian history at some other point. Of course, this was a, a less important power than Serbia, but, right, there is also, like, historically, like, it's, a, it's an importantly extensive area that had, in fact, quite interesting development uh, on its own, right? So, as we've seen, in spite of Chaslav's reign, uh, who died sometime between the 40s and the 60s of the 10th century, um, the situation of, Ser uh, of the Serbian principality was not good to the point that it sort of ended together with the Vlastimirovic uh, dynasty, right? With Constantine VII's source, we have most of the information on the current Serbian affairs um, by the, in fact, the, the mid 10th century. But basically, uh, we know a few about uh, the rest, right? So we'll see it in um, in other videos because uh, things start getting interesting again from the 11th century there's a moment of you know stasis uh, of some sort when John the first Tsimiskas uh, inflicted a heavy defeat on the Bulgarians in 971 the Byzantine mm, rule uh, managed to reach uh, in the Balkan interland the same Danubian frontier again. This uh, happened as a broader re-expansion of the empire after 300 years, right? The Danube was historically, like, had remained the boundary of the Roman Empire, but as far as it could be directly reached, controlled by the Byzantines, right? It, it's, it, it's another story. As a consequence, just by geographical um, um, logic, also the Serbian lands were brought again under the Byzantine Empire, right? And this is witnessed, archaeologically speaking, by many coin hordes that uh, show us how in the end of the 10th, the early 11th century, there was a pretty substantial interaction between the Byzantines, the Bulgarians, and the Serbs, 
Eventually, we see wealth circulating, we see these peoples. Um, I mean, the Balkan interland being here a bit puzzled and fragmented, eventually, you know, that Basil II would bring down the, the Bulgarians for good, at least in the imperial form that they had given themselves uh, politically. Um, and so the Serbians had a chance to, to, of, of re-expansion in spite of the the Hungarian bullying um, and more that's something we will see hopefully uh, in in the future. Um, so you have as, as a successor state of the Principality of Serbia the Katapanat of Raš, right, established around 971, so in parallel with the Byzantines warming in the in the broader region. And as you understand from the name, which was used also in other provinces, for example in Italy, this was actually a Byzantine-ruled province, right? Uh, Catapanate comes from Captain Capitanate, basically. Um, and in fact, we know of a Byzantine, an imperial administrator, being at the head of it, right? Uh, Catapan or Dux who ruled from the same Rash fortress, the Stary Rash, that um, is, uh, again, we will talk about it in another video, but it's this medieval fortress, um, vicinity of, of being the, the, the former marketplace of Staro Torgovis. Um, it's uh, modern day, something like 10 kilometers west of Novi Pazar in, in Serbia. Needless to say, the Byzantine control of the Balkan interland was, however feeble, right? It was just a product of this mo momentary power vacuum, and there was no way, really, and historically at that point, to have a sound, direct control um, on the, especially the Balkan interland proper. I mean, as long as it was some garrisons on the major Danubian fortresses, or even one like Rash, okay, but in the further Balkan interland, good luck with that, right? It was always an incredibly difficult ground, full of guerrilla resistance. Again, they were miserable places, but they they were able to maintain their autonomy um, in that in that circumstance. In 976, when John I died, we witnessed the Kometopuli um, rebellion, taking the name from the dynasty that began to rule what essentially was left of the first Bulgarian Empire and that in fact would end in 1018 when Basil II basically brought down these guys uh, for for good, right? Um, there would be some Balkan coming backs and um, you know the, there was an attempt of course to restore Bulgarian power but this just engulfed the region further because that's where the, the the Byzantines basically set their mind to basically eradicate this power once for all, right? And so in this pretty bloody mm, situation, in 991-992, the Serbians sent a delegation to the same Basil II, um, which um, actually we think was not coming from the continental part, but just from the Adriatic one. So the continental part was still, you know, pretty much exhausted from the previous generations. We know that Jovan Vladimir, the ruler of Duklea, that was, in fact, as a consequence, the most, apparently the most powerful Serbian principality of the time, at the beginning of the 11th century, practically, um, um, had a maritime power stretching over the broader areas of Serbia, right? Uh, so the continental side having s still, again, a lot to recover and this sort of more autonomous, also more reactivated powers on from the sea because you see the Byzantines had re-extended substantially their control in the Adriatic by, the, by this point. It's a moment of major peak that Basil II reinstates. I made a video about this, also the, the cost of the recovery, etc. It's, it's an interesting thing. But there is a general recovery in Europe, so you can expect these Serbian principalities on the Adriatic, albeit not being extremely powerful, having some important recovery in comparison. 
and embodying uh, essentially Serbian rule at that time rather than the continent as it would historically develop more right um, with the final defeat of Bulgaria in 1018 the same Serbia in fact seems to have remained engulfed right um, between this broader you know devastation and uh, what was formerly the Byzantine rule right at that time, the Byzantines organized Serbia into a theme, so a military and administrative division of the empire ruled by a strategus. Duklia was, uh, so this encompassed mostly the, um, the, the interland part, like the continental part. We know that the Adriatic one was different. Duklia was subordinated to the Dukes of Dyrrachium, the Paris. We do not know much about Travunia. There is literally nothing recorded about that. We know that the Serbian princes were present in Zaklumia continuously throughout this time, and that the Byzantines had made some effort to integrate them further in the, you know, in the Byzantine to co-op them in some way, like the Byzantine government. For example, the prince uh, Lut Tobed of this, uh, in fact, ruler of, of Zamulia with the, the, the title of Nets was conferred the title of Protos Patarios, uh, that is one of actually the highest court dignities in the middle Byzantine period and usually awarded to senior generals and provincial governors, but also, like in this case, as well as to foreign princes. And there was the extensive um, in fact, titling of Protos Patarius Epito Christriclinu, that is to say, uh, the first sword bearer. So, actually, a very important, um, at least, facade um, title for actually gaining more control on the Adriatic coast from Constantinople. Right? We know that the same loot of was at some point appointed as uh, strategus of Serbia and Zaklumia. So we, we actually know that he didn't have a real control over this broader Serbia. Here, actually, from the title, we can understand that Serbia and Zaklumia, what the hell does that mean? You know, first of all, there are many other Adriatic um, polities like Zaklumia. And so here, Serbia means like like the totality of Serbia, well, the guy never ruled over the totality of Serbia. But even clearly, the Byzantines were anxious to again consolidate um, a guy's power in a in an Adriatic context to use it also to for for their uh, Italian uh, policy to reactivate their presence uh, uh, there, the, the connections with Venice and lots of other stuff. Uh, this, of course, wouldn't quite. Uh, go on uh, excessively at least, you know, there would be eventually the rise of a of a Serbian kingdom that this did still have an important um, contribution from the Jesriatic era, but sort of um, you know, was unavoidably centered on Raska right, and this uh, would be more evident later on. What, what is interesting of, of this of these uh, politics is how you know many ups and downs they really had right how much they how sheltered they technically were but how difficult it was for them still to consolidate um, locally and that's something again we'll see in other videos about about Serbia which has again a, a very uh, a remarkable history and especially like this continuous torment, right, in, capaci in the capacity of, again, power concentration uh, and more, right, uh, until the final Ottoman conquest, of course. Then we will see this in some other uh, video, hopefully. For today, however, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. 
As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.